the Living 1982 podcast. Were you into the punk scene in the very early 80s or someone who discovered the genre along the way? Well, we're doing some deep diving into the Seattle punk scene and sharing the story behind a band that was very short-lived but made a lasting impact with members going on to being in some of the biggest bands in the world. Their debut album was never released back in the day but is finally out now. This is the story of the I'll, living. I'll, <laughs> I'll give a little history to to the the living for you guys. Just a little brief history. Great. Todd had brought up uh, Chris Udding, Chris Crass, as he he was known. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So the original, he, he's there. the original uh, version of this band was getting Todd in. Uh, I was gonna put me and Chris Udding were playing guitar. And we'd switch and drums, so we'd switch off like halfway through the set. It was a little awkward, and um, Chris Udding was some could be difficult to work with, uh, and especially Todd, who was young and exuberant about playing bass. And I'll figure it out in a bit. You know, he just learned how to play. He'll figure the song out. Um, if you were a taskmaster, taskmaster around task master with Todd at that point, it would have been kind of useless. He was just learning how to play. Like he had all the exuberance that you need and all of that, right? And Chris Edding wasn't giving him that chance. Uh, there was one rehearsal in particular that I could see Todd, I, like I knew Todd for a few years before this. So I could see, when I saw the look in his eye, like you, you back up. Because it's not going to be end well for if you're on the other end of the look of that eye. So Chris Edding was kind of in, in Todd's face, not something you want to ever do. Todd's a good guy. He'll have your back forever. But you don't want to do any of this kind of stuff to him. Uh, I think that was done in the basement of your house. Oh, yeah. And there was, he didn't, Todd was nice. He didn't uh, take out the, this Chris Edding. He just put his head, his fist through the wall right next to his head. Oh, yeah. I remember um, that well. And it was time to get a new drummer. It was time to figure out, refigure out this band. So we, there was an ad. I, as I remember it, Stone and Regan and guys. Oh. We haven't talked about this beforehand, so I'm just going by shit memory. Um, yeah. I remember the drummers that came in. Oh my God, we had some fun ones. Right I'm before sure. for before Greg. Right. I'm I mean, sure. we had guys do do that do 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 that hippie guys with fucking was like that ain't gonna work. Right, man. And I know Greg's eyes were probably dilated, going, "Who the fuck are these guys?" <laughs> He's like, Greg had everything. He had. Electronic drums. I did not. He had <laughs> gongs and all this other <laughs> shit. Yeah, he, gongs? he was. He had Stuart <laughs> Copeland shit. He was all over it. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> the punk rock was so new, and what we were trying to do was was carve a new singular path that we would discover as we went along. Um, there was no. There was DOA. There was the Clash. Yeah. yeah. There was the Germ. There was records we were getting from Southern California and from the East Coast and from England that we UK subs and and you Sex know, Pistols. Sex Pistols, of course, and and the Germs and whatever. Yeah. Um, I even have some lewd singles. Lewd. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> trash can <laughs> baby. Yeah. The yeah. With the re I mean, because I always, in my vision, the Seattle bands were frat boy bands. Like the Cowboys and, right. yeah. and the Range Hoods and all that safe, Bar um, bands kind of. Uh, safe kind of stuff. So I mean, even right. uh, even for even our band was like, whoa! They were like, whoa! You guys are too extreme, and I don't think we were extreme. We at weren't all. that extreme. No. no, but I think we were. We really weren't. But to them, you know, when I saw like Fear and fucking and stuff like that, and and then. Um, DOA, I go, DOA, okay. DOA is cool. I was going, okay. But nothing was like that, like radical or anything, or, you know. Uh, Scary, anything. dangerous. For, yeah, because um, Seattle just 
flat out wasn't ready for no. uh, punk rock no. at that time. And Vancouver was kind of the scene that we, we at least for me, that we yeah. looked to. Our, yeah. to. So they, they had DOA, they had the Subhumans, they had the Modernettes, who were this killer fucking pop band. Um, they had really cool, and they had a scene that was, and they had like punk rock houses where you could stay. We, I mean, DOA yeah. was my, basically my kiss. After Kiss Alive 1, I, which I got when I was 12, then it was the, the Pistols, and then I got the DOA Prisoner single, and like these guys are from around close to here, but they were, to me, they were huge. The first time I saw them, and my, we played a show at Monroe's Dance Palace, and they were the headliners. Um, I think that we tangled. We we showed them Duff's went, head went through the fucking ceiling and shit, and fuck, it was a great was a show. Good show for us. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, DOA's. Yeah, they were. Um, I thought the pinnacle of, I mean, the, cause like fear and stuff and the, and the, uh, the dead Kennedys, um, they were just kind of far away. They weren't like, uh, approachable as the uh, DOA was. So Greg, Wait, can I ask about I, Greg I'm going to run this interview what was the, a little bit. How did we get, how did we get, so Greg had an ad in what paper in the, in the rocket? It was the rocket. Oh, was it the Do rocket? Do you remember something that you guys had? I thought I remember. Oh, Pittsburgh? we put something up. Yeah, right? too bad it wasn't the strange. I answered fight. an ad in the rocket. <laughs> we had an ad in the rocket. <laughs> the way, the yeah. way I remember it, yeah. yeah. And do you and do you remember what the, the verbiage was with the ad? Man, not at all. No. Okay. What I remember was making my way out. It, so I was not long, had not been in Seattle for, what, it, I, uh, if we recorded in 82, then we must have met him in playing somewhere in 81 so i had been in seattle for some months right kind of going to school at the u and didn't have a, hardly any didn't know anybody here really friends not many guys i lived with answered now the rocket made my way out to laurelhurst which was foreign new territory to me and knocked on the door and this fucking huge guy with blue hair answers. <laughs> <laughs> Dyed my hair. I was in a hair fashion show. Oh, and, I forgot about that. Yeah. And so I had blue <laughs> hair, right? Um, Free hair. hair, and, hair color, yeah. Right? And so so um, I went swimming in a, in a chlorine <laughs> pool. And then it turned silver, but it was cool. It was really cool. But you go to train yeah, well. I remember the silver. Parents would... Grab their kids like, oh, the disgusting punk rocker. <laughs> that moment was for me the beginning of everything yeah. for me in Seattle, <clears throat> musically, and yeah. I had instantly had a large circle of friends, yeah. family, girlfriend, family, basically. Was this a year before the recording of 1982, uh, or man, I, how, how much I don't, before? I don't think it was. Things happened so fast. Yeah, yeah. In those days, I don't. I, I think I I might have had a, a slew of songs. Is that right, Todd? Yes. Do we yeah, work were, on yes, yeah, we were had a lot of songs. I, see, we had I, stuff the pre, the pre um, Greg right. stuff. So we had that handful of stuff, and then when we got Greg, we moved from my house, my um, mom's house, to this. Big, huge, fourteen thousand square foot place on um, Madison, right on Madison Park. Yeah, or, uh, Capitol yeah. Hill. Yeah, Capitol Hill. And we, we went there before going to. Yeah, because we practiced there. The we practiced there. Yeah, before the. Oh, was it before the? Ad? Because I know before we went to the studio, we were practicing in that place because we didn't sing. There was no singing. We were just. Practice and practice and practice to get sharp, right. to get yeah. totally solid. We worked I, hard. The way I'm remembering it, we the last place that we practiced was at that. Go, above Godfathers? No, at the warehouse. Yeah, at the warehouse. Because that's because I'm remembering. Was that the beginning of the at end? At some point, then <laughs> yeah, John was gone, and then Jerry Porkface came over once or twice to play, oh. and then went out, uh. and we kind of. 
It yeah. just ran out right there. Yeah. Right. I'm just remembering being in that. <clears throat> yeah. We, we had like a 14,000. We had the whole floor yeah. of this empty concrete wow. warehouse. And we were, it had a big service elevator. Yeah. Like a, like a, like you could drive a truck yeah. right to this elevator in the middle of it. <clears throat> the, and both ends of the elevator opened, right? Yeah. yeah. And we just pulled down the doors on both sides and played inside this big yeah, it was box. Cr- in crazy. There. But I remember yes. like, just being in there and Jerry was had come and gone and we were sitting around looking at each right. other like, well, what now? So rehearsal places back then too were a whole different thing and you guys probably remember this. Um, but Todd's house, Todd's family house was kind of open Todd's mom was really cool with us kids like she would make food and and um and let us rehearse in the basement at his house um we could come in the back door but we'd often just come in the front door because his mom would want us to come in the front door when I when I listen to these songs on this record one thing that strikes me is just how mature the arrangements are in terms of like dynamics and like breaks and drum fill you know like yeah. they're they're punk but they also have all this structure to them and and some real like you know meaty arrangements like and uh songs. you know and and even uh Greg I was going to ask you this just um had you played sort of that tempo of stuff before was that was that kind of a new range for you in terms of like playing at that speed because you sound so natural on all that stuff i mean it's just like the drumming is unbelievable it's just great but uh were you had you been playing in that kind of tempo range well yeah but not <clears throat> not that music that was yeah it was pretty new thing to me along with everything else i mean you were a king crimson man i mean but the the, the, uh, (laughs) also a big a record really (laughs) key in my development up to that time had been uh, a deep purple live record oh and they played fast yeah they did yeah made in japan which is a favorite to by many to mock in terms of like the arrangements were those you basically kind of putting those arrangements together how were you kind of doing that what was a little can you tell us a little bit about your process of writing songs back then or how you kind of you know got I had into a little kind of bit of a, songs I had a little bit of a head start uh had a taught probably a couple years I would say I was in bands for a yeah, couple yeah. years um, so in the veins, I wrote my first ever song, which is called "The Fake," and it's that so- was a great song. Yeah, um, oh man! That's but I didn't know how to write songs, you know, it, at at all. And ha- like, I had Todd. We, like, we Todd and I were doing two things at once. Uh, I was teaching him how to play, and he was reminding me of like the freshness of, the excitement of just I'm going to downstroke the whole fucking set, <laughs> right? And that's right. We're both yeah. going to downset the whole downstroke the whole fucking set. And just that energy was great and that super influenced riffs. Um Todd and I I know before Greg came in, we really started exploring like those those breakdowns where it just be the bass and drums, right? And like the right. reintro thing or just intros and outros, something we'd never done before. Simple things. Um, I don't think we were copying anybody. We were inventing it as it went. When Gray got in the band, that added a, this super solid and almost fancy uh, element. Like we could do anything rhythmically that we wanted to because Greg could. Greg had, I mean, a plethora of knowledge. I mean, he was he could play any style. And so having somebody with that's such a solid so i go my game is now to connect with the drummer and be like a fucking anvil bam be and so then duff can play and do what he needs to do and then the vocals because when duff and i were uh, practicing stuff we're, there was this crunchy kind of just like a um a, a train going down locomotive kind of sound you know boom 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 uh very tight but um 
it wasn't twangy. It was crunchy. Uh, album called uh, Empire uh, by uh, Oh Jesus Empire. Yes. I still have that. Yes, and I, I still that. have it. Do you guys know that record? I don't. That, I don't that, know. that that says a lot. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. That so. that record says a lot about it's the three guys from Generation X, uh, X Billy Idol, and they made they were right. called Empire. The record was called Empire. There's only a few people who really know about this record. No, they don't, and they're missing out. Yeah. Because it is, I go back, and I listen to it, and I'm going, wow, that that album resonated with me more than The Clash, more than anything, because it wasn't mainstream, and it was um, uh, really, it, it uh, I go, I can play this, and... And it's great. I mean, three, because really, basically, we were a three-piece band, and then you throw a singer in, right? Yeah. So to be uh, three-piece has to be tight. Um, so, um, you know, because if you have an extra guitar player, you can hide shit. A three-piece, we were tight, and, um, and, it, and I think it shows on the uh, recording I mean, like I told, I was telling Greg, I go, you guys are the musicians. I just look good. What shows did you guys play with this line, with the lineup that's on 1982? Did you, did you play any? Man, well, one of the best shows that I think we played, it was at this place. I don't know if it was called the Morrison Hotel or something. It was off, off um, the Pioneer Square, but probably one of the, Best shows that I um, ever experienced. And when we played um, Ballroom Blitz, fucking play some rap. Fucking Is that fun. what you called our singer? The hall monitor? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> can we talk about um, John? I mean, and we yeah. can, you know, either use a little bit of this or not. But I'm, I'm just curious about, I, I know that the, uh, I know that there's been some, you know, difficulty um, in the communication and stuff, but uh, God, he's political. <laughs> that was smooth, man. Well, nicely, um, put. Man. nicely played. Well, mm. I, I'm just, I'm just curious about him. I mean, he's, he does such a great. I mean, he sings his ass off yeah. on this stuff, and he, oh and he no, really he does a great he, job. He's and, a great singer. He's, he's like most lead singers. They need a pill now and then. Here you go. He was definitely yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, he had he had the thing like what I've noticed with singers, I I didn't really know it then. No. You know, I mean there was there was Ron Ray's who we had become friends with, the Black Flag guy that the veins we played with Black Flag at the Washington Hall in '79, and Ron Ray's was fucking crazy, and I thought he was gonna kick everybody's ass. And and knowing Ron after that and now still to this day, he's the most mild mannered guy, but he's got something extra. Something that snapped. The first time I saw Axel down in, in L.A. in 84, he was as gnarly as Henry Rollins first time I saw Rollins. Like, scary, you backed up from the stage a couple steps. Like, uh, this guy, I don't know what's going on, but he could explode any moment. And John had some of those elements to him. And so you're going to get, with John, he was... It was easy to, you know, like when we first got him in the band, he had been in some other band that wasn't punk rock. So Missing he, Link. Missing Link, that's... Yes. Oh, they were kind of like a new wave. Yeah, kind of, yeah. I'm feeling, well, with Johnny Blackberry, how hard are you going to get? Right, right. But anyway. Um, Johnny Vinyl. So they had that... I'm feeling like a yeah. worm, right? What? I'm feeling like a worm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so we got John in the band, and I... I my memory's not super great. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Like this, the recordings when when Greg sent me this stuff, eight months, six months ago, I hadn't heard this stuff since then. Uh, wow. I was fucking blown away. I was like, and the mix that Greg put on this, I was like, the bass is killer. I texted Todd. I'm like, the bass is. I thought he was so shitting me. I was not shitting you. No, the <laughs> bass is fucking killer. The drums sound amazing, and the songs, some of the lyrics on them, which I, I will raise my hand, it's, it's, it's my doing, are very sophomore. You know, it's very, I'm 17. I think they're and, perfect. Yeah.
All these guys, we didn't have any, you know, I, I, uh, was Todd's family wasn't from money. My family wasn't from money. It's Greg came up from gig heart. We didn't have any, there was no money to be, you know, to get a Gibson guitar or something. Like, forget about it. Todd, it's got this Fender bass. It was like, whoa, you got the real, like, Fender bass. And I was playing through a, a borrowed guitar of either Kurt Blocks or Paul Soldiers. And these guys for my 17th birthday, they all pitched in like a dozen people or 15, I don't even know. But they got me this Hamer special, Johnny Thunder's double cutaway, um, that I was blown away. I, I still have a picture of them with, the, with the, the guitar and the birthday cake. And you can see the look on my face, I'm just blown away. I got this little amp and I don't, I think I might have bought it from you, Greg, that Mitchell amp, or you went with me to find it? You know, I don't know. I was thinking about that the other day because I remember you did have one of those, but I ha also had one, but I don't. Oh, did you also have one? I think that was oh, it. Okay. I just also had one. It was, a, it was called a Mitchell. It was a combo, and um, I that thing had such a specific sound to it, uh, for sure. It was became part of the sound. Um, of, of that. And, and actually, I used it all the way through 10-Minute Warning and everything. MXR distortion pedal, or no. what, did you have a distortion pedal with it, or no. just it would drive itself? Yeah, I didn't know about pedals or anything yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I first started out with a, um, this uh, Mateo that Charlie Marinkovich did some crazy work and put these pickups in it. But then when I got my um, oh the P bass, yes, the bass? Okay. my first bass, my black and white one was a Mateo that was Frankenstein. But then I got this white. Um, cause I wanted to be like Sid Vicious really bad, but it came out, it was white on white, uh, and it was a 57 P bass reissue. And wow. I was going, it, it's fucking beautiful. Now where, it, it where turned yellow, that? but I got that at American music and I paid cash. Did you? Yeah. Fuck. I was, I, I just fucking, yeah. I still have the bass. I love it. It's still, it's perfect. I've gone through like four cases though i don't know what happens to cases but they just wreck yeah if it wasn't for duff showing me how to play i mean i think we played uh batman at uh at roosevelt high for a talent show do 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 batman but anyway first song that i ever learned how to play i didn't play it well but it was good i looked good that's what matt but todd was natural he was a natural he he'll make fun of himself you know but in, in right. truth, you either have the yeah, thing. the rhythm. Yeah, he, his rhythm is incredible. It's great. Yeah, incredible. He had a great right arm, uh, right hand, and uh, and the fire and the fire. And he uh, he worked hard at it. You know, it wasn't like he was fucking around. And the the band worked hard when Todd yeah. and these guys were saying, you know, we, you were saying we were up there and we just rehearsed, just rehearsed. Yeah, we, we would were, practice forever. Yeah, I mean, the time would go by. And, Day be daylight. Next thing you know, it's like eleven o'clock, and we've been sitting there. We wanted to play. Yeah. We we put the time in. We and, wanted to be. And a, that was and with a singer or without a singer. Was that that's no? Just the when three we were guys? getting ready to go in the studio, it was boom. We played all the songs, every song, all the time without singing. So you weren't waiting for the cue from the singer. You just knew right when you were to come in. The timing had to be. Um, impeccable every time. And so we John was kind of, he wasn't going to so many rehearsals at that point. He was, no, he was there. He, just, he, he was a, a, a bystander. Yeah. I mean, yeah. some, he wanted to be a, uh, the guitar player uh, really badly, um, but that was, yeah. Yeah. He'd bring out a guitar. He was, he, so, so back to John, just, uh, um, he was just a, he was, he was a, Good. I mean, there wasn't many singers like sing that could sing a melody then, or yeah. you know, there was none of that kind of thing. He'd sing from the diaphragm, but and he would. He knew how to yeah. s like sing. He knew how to sing, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, we were probably too young to appreciate, you know, some of his uh, ups and downs. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Um, his challenges. Yep. His yeah. challenges. Yeah. And we were just because we were like. You know, a, a eight-cylinder, uh, you know, uh, SS Chevelle hot rod going straight. And if you 
weren't on board, you know, fuck you. So yeah. when when John wasn't on board sometimes, like he was having some issues, whatever, we couldn't appreciate that. Um, maybe we'll just slow down for a second and, and, and take a look at John. But uh, We didn't know. We I, didn't know. Who, who, when you're that young, who do you know yeah. that um, things, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, because, I mean, I, God, I, I feel like I still, to this day, I've given a lot more than I got back, so, and yeah. from his situation. But he could sing. The guy was a singer. He had good stage presence, and he just had some... Uh, I, I mean, just has such a natural delivery. He can sing, yeah. but he's not being overly professional or sort no. of like, he's right. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. feeling it. I mean, he's in there, and he's... The music's coming through him. He's doing something. But, you know, and he was it starts a, he with was the arrangements, real... too. It starts with, like, these yeah. songs that are, like, animating him and, like, you know... Well, I thought he was a stuff. Roger Daltrey kind... Cause so you like to fucking swing that fucking microphone now and then, and of course somebody would get hit with it. Boom. So Todd hasn't really changed. Todd was, uh, uh, you can tell by his personality, he, magnetic personality. Uh, either way, whether you liked it or didn't like it, he was going to be him. That's um, right. John, uh, yeah, was 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 great on stage. Figured, you know, figured it out, and we just all figured it out together. That's right. And, and we, I, for me. I wanted to be like the new, in my, if I look back now, and I remember thinking this then, I wanted to be the new DOA. I wanted to be something, something more. There was, there was, there was Empire, like Todd said, yeah. like a band that we. You got to check that out. You know, I'd recorded, I think, with the Veins, three songs. I recorded drums with the Fastbacks on two or three songs. Um, Greg knew a thing or two about recording. Like he had a little, you had an eight track or four track reel to yeah, reel at yeah. home. <clears throat> four track. Um, but so, so all we knew to get ready for a recording was just be tight as fuck. John, we probably didn't have a PA too. Was, no. Well, Chris had the PV yeah. in the beginning. Chris Hiding. Yes. Yeah. And then when that disappeared, um, there yeah. went the PA. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't remember if we sang through uh, John's amp. amp. I think you're think right. Yeah, because uh, yeah, he had the master man or whatever yeah. the fuck thing is. One day at American Music, two days? What was it? Eight hours? It was a, the first five tunes were a day. An afternoon? I don't know. But we right. went back to mix, I think. I don't think we walked out with... That I don't, I'm not sure about. No. Then, then, I know what was recording was one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And then uh, the last two tunes were recorded by an intern at this studio, the same studio, a week or two or so after. And those I definitely I, remember I, going back to mix. How is it possible that this music... Like right. didn't get copied and then well, cause that's didn't get passed around I had at the a, time. Yeah, we all a had cassette case. We all, uh, we all uh, had cassettes. That, yeah, I had a cassette, and, we and all I was loved like it. one of the only ones that had one at one time. And I gave it to you, uh, give so you could have it. But yeah, we didn't have anything. I I don't even remember where the live shit came from. I mean, I know that we played a show at uh, at um, the Harvard Exit. Did we play a show oh, there? Yes. Yeah, so we the played at the Harvard team. Exit, and then we played at the Rex that was the Vogue, yeah. and we played there. Um, but, yeah, I can't. Um, but the, for the life of me, how did, did it get out? I think we did a, um, a radio thing for a college. Um, so why did it never come out? It was, it was a cross. It was a time of uh, there was no labels. There was nothing right. yet. Yeah. If you wanted to put it out, you, you know, Kurt could put yeah. it out but that was too many songs for a no three single um but hardcore came in and, and t to many people's uh, agreements you know it just the, the wrong kids came in from the suburbs and Absolutely. the guys who used to throw rocks at us for being punk rock faggots quote unquote yep. We're now yep. coming in and shaving their heads and doing neo-nazi shit and and whatever and yeah. hardcore just ruined 
like the good, like a, a, a fun band like Malfunction who were coming to have fun and experiment and do stuff as weirdos. That wasn't accepted yeah. anymore. You know, Correct. you either play fucking, uh, you know, one, two, three, four right now or fuck you. We're going to kick your ass, you know. And um, not that we had a problem because we were big guys and, and they had Todd yeah. in the yeah. band. Like, like that was not a problem getting our ass kicked. We would do the ass kicking, but we had to then. Yeah. You know, you had to fight. You had to do all this shit. I uh, remember. We were welcomed by, by DOA, which was a big thing yeah. for us we'd stay at their house in vancouver and todd would yep. steal beer with joey shithead yeah we used to go into a, a place with bolt cutters go into the um this big huge uh like uh a driveway go in there and there'd be trucks and we'd just come up goon cut them and then run away i was laughing so hard i was like pissing yeah. my pants and going we're gonna get busted and we're laughing and we're stealing beer and I uh, Ron from Black Flag was there. He was doing T-shirts, and I was sleeping like a bum with newspaper because they didn't have any place to sleep. So I'm sleeping on the floor on Robson Street, which is now the the heroin capital of the world up there. Um, we had a fucking great time. Mm. Oh man, it was fun. I mean, there was this band called the Wipers. Yeah. And, uh, oh, I mean, from Portland. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they were up there. Um, uh, the Subhumans, DOA, uh, and so these people look bigger than life to me. I was like, this is all fucking, you know, new to me. Just like the seeing the refusers and stuff. They were all older than us. Right. Yeah. So yes. we were just like the young fucking kids on the on the block. So everybody was older. I mean, yeah. even the fastbacks, they were all yeah. older than us. And so it was kind of a... Um, uh, we were getting mentored, uh, you know, we didn't, nobody really knew what they were doing was making up on the fly, you know, pretty much. I mean, I mean, the gray door, gorilla, uh, gorilla gardens, um, the gorilla room sneaking in there. Yeah. We weren't old enough to be drinking and we're drinking. I, yeah, got, yes. I got busted. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I had to do like At the gorilla room. Yeah. I, there was undercover vice squat whatever they are yeah. you know alcohol oh, but so yeah i was so young drinking in the grill room you're not supposed to be and be there yeah. you're supposed to play your show and then you leave nobody knows about it really regan you were there stone you came in about 82 way late. right way way late i mean i, yeah, I but it's all right 80, 80 is not that i got late. to see tim in a warning you know right that's pretty good right oh, but man. but Jeez, um man. But uh, uh, my point uh, to Todd's point about everybody being together, um, that was a thing then. Like, um, totally, people would share ideas. Like, I didn't know how to play uh, a Steve Jones lead, you know, I, I or Johnny Thunder's lead. I learned that from Kurt Block would show me this, or you know, Slats would have some. Slats was a guy from the Silly Killers, uh, kind of renowned in Seattle. He died a few years ago. He he never pulled it together and actually got worse and worse. And uh, yep, but he, in one. back in the day, he was this handsome, gregarious, cool as fuck guitar player. He was, playing, he was really cool. Really yeah. cool. And um, and so you would you would pick up things like uh, me teaching Todd to play bass or or wherever he learned it from. Maybe I showed him the first no, few things. No, you showed me how to play. But but that was just the way it was in Seattle. Yeah. Then everybody would show each other yeah. stuff. There was no. Uh, if you needed some gear, some other band would loan you. Like, I had a loan guitar for fucking two years, you know. Um, no problem, you know. And it, it was... Uh, uh, it wasn't competition. No. It was... We wanted a place to play. Because after a while, things were... They didn't want to have punk rock shows at the this hallway, the VAF or whatever. Sometimes there would be one light bulb. And you're playing to... Uh, this basement filled with uh, punk rock people, you know, people that you, you know, uh, and it will be an abandoned house or some kind of deal. It was just some crazy stuff going on, but it was so new that that scene was, I don't know, it was, it was just different, but it got evil after a while. 
I mean, Bremerton folks started rolling in, and, you know, then you got, um, there would never be grunge without punk rock and heavy metal melting at the gray door. I keep thinking about, you know, the nature of some of those riffs that I'm hearing, and then I heard those kind of in 10-minute warning, and then I hear a little bit of what I heard in Guns N' Roses, and it's like, I hear in that, in that, in 1982, the elements of the things that I could hear Paul Soldier doing, or I could hear just getting kind of spread around, so it's like, there's so much of the nucleus of what made me so excited about hearing live music in Seattle in this record. That's it. As I listen that's to it, I'm just great. like, oh my God, that's like, it just, it sort of foreshadows so much of what ended up being the language that everybody kind of used to, you know, it's groovy, it's heavy, it's fast, but it's slow. I mean, it's like, you kind of have all the elements of it. So it's, it's just one of those just, things, Stone. It's really, it's one of those things where, you know, by me meeting Todd and him like giving me a different angle on playing like, oh yeah, it's fresh and, 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 and then Greg coming in and like, oh, this is not that I hadn't played with real drummers, but I, I didn't really, I had to be the drummer in bands because there wasn't real drummers. I'm not a great drummer, you know, uh, but getting Greg in and like, oh, there's a real hi-hat and there's movement on the hi-hat he's actually doing there's something going on just with the fucking hi-hat and then the snare and the kick is this other thing so i think todd would probably be on one side of the drum kits looking at greg's you know kick drum and i'd be on the other side of his kit looking at hi-hat and somehow that that thing uh created like like uh todd said like it was a tight engine it was and it was very uh we knew like we would it go any further than our basement? We don't know, but we had something magical then and it was ours and who gives a fuck, you know? There were so many different players and really good and unique players then and and individuals and so much different music to listen to because it wasn't we weren't just listening to punk rock. We were listening to the Sweet and Slade and and Greg took me to fucking see King Crimson. We were on Mushrooms at the Paramount. Nice. And that, <laughs> you know, Robert Fripp and Adrian Ballou and Bruford and uh, Tony yeah. Levin. And, you know, we're on Mushrooms. I'm like, it's all relatable if it's coming from the heart and coming from the right place. Um, I loved Prince, you know. Oh, I, man, Prince. I loved uh, soul music and, and R&B music and... and we, we didn't poo-poo Led Zeppelin or anything, you know, because we were punk rock. We were too fresh into it. We were like, this is all fucking cool. ACDC was cool. They were considered a punk rock band. You bet. Girl School. Girl um, School. Oh, yeah. Motorhead. Yeah, of course. Motorhead. When we were playing, we were, like, influenced. Like, oh, you stole this from uh, Led Zeppelin or uh, DOA or any of this. It was like, we were trying to be us trying to be just us not going oh i'm going to sound exactly like um like uh, generation x or something like that which are fabulous and, yeah and i would say that's probably another like influence is yeah. generation X. yes they were yeah. but um it was like we weren't trying to be them no. you know like uh you know stuff like that but they were at certain putting the, the palm of your hand on the strings and going you know man you can't get away from that stuff. So the first instrument I, I bought, I had a Seattle Times paper route, and there was this shade. I had three. Yeah. I, yeah, I had, yeah. So we all had yeah, paper routes, right? Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. P.I. and the Times. There was some shady me guy. Me too, both. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, um, there was a shady guy who had a, a, a base for sale for 100 bucks, $120. It was a Gibson EBO. Was that that little short one that you had? Yeah. The Foghorn Bass? Fog yeah. yeah. That was badass. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I always wanted, I thought that was so cool, man. So that was the first instrument that I could afford to get. And it was, it was electric fucking guitar, you know? I was 12 or 13, and I got that and like started to learn how to play. We, we formed the veins, but I saw, you know, I saw DOA. And it, like, if you want to be a bass player, it's fucking Randy Rampage. Oh, if yeah. you want to be a drummer, which I became four months later, 
Chuck fa- Biscuits. You want to be Chuck Biscuits, man. Oh, man, Chuck. You know, uh, you want to play guitar. I mean, really, was it was so much DOA. And, I mean, guitar-wise, I went to Johnny Thunder's ALAMF, yeah. uh, Steve Jones, full on. You know, yeah. uh, I, uh, those Generation X records are great. But then this Empire record, which you guys got to listen to, was this... And it was this big open cor- uh, chords, mm. which I, I didn't really realize he was using a chorus pedal and probably something else on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just thought his guitar... I want to play that good, you know? But I didn't have effects pedals, so we tried to be that good without knowing how to do it. Um, so you just practice more and more. But it was definitely Thunders, Steve Jones, Randy Rampage, yeah. Chuck Biscuits. Yeah. The Tales of Terror guys would come into the, to the city. I would, like, sit down, you know, with those guys, you know, like learn other, a guitar riff, you know. Can you show me how to play that? Or the Personality right. Crisis, you remember yeah. them? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. They would come in two great guitar players, Richard Duguay and... Uh, the other guy went to DOA for a while. But I would sit, they would sit, you know, I'd sit down with them and like, can you show me how to play this fucking thing? And you would learn other, you know, I didn't know how to get a guitar. I wasn't going to get a guitar book. I just want to learn, like, what did you just play? Yeah. And people were cool enough then in those I didn't days. even know the notes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, play A, okay. He didn't know. Second string down. Yeah. T- <laughs> Todd didn't know the notes. It yeah. didn't matter. But it was all hearing, though. You could hear. Yeah. After a while, I'd go, now I can understand a person who plays the trombone. You know, it was a different time. It was Soviet Russia, nuclear war, and we had this new President Reagan who was kind of more uh, a, a saber rattler to us at that point. And it's like mm-hmm. our, our older brothers had been in Vietnam, you know, like, we're not going to go fight a fucking nuclear war for this this fucking actor you know uh, you know <laughs> yeah, fuck sure. you um if there's gonna be a change it's got to be us you know it's got to be us who make the change like a new sort of uh rebel you know a uh, minor threat was doing the dc bands were doing a bunch of shit which we kind of knew about but we were just doing our own thing in particular i remember being somebody's maybe at todd's house like, uh, seems like there was a party or something, and we t- t- went and hid away upstairs in somebody's room and sat there and just right in front of me in as much time as it took to play it, basically wrote, I'm pretty sure it was Live by the Gun. Okay. Words of music. Oh, then a thing like this. And then, yeah, I heard it four times. Then a thing like this. There we go. One, the... <sighs> You had a, you know, basic melody was part of the, yeah, writing the thing on the spot. And yeah, I think it was all more, kind more of less, there, more or less what John was doing. But John was, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I, I can't really. I, I'll, I'll just say this: I can't really remember. Um, I know the the songs when when Greg sent me the tape. I'm like, oh fuck, I didn't realize, you know, there was that many songs and and. Uh, and I just remember writing parts, and then uh, and I just I, what I remember is Todd like writing parts, and Todd would be like, okay, and then he go, well, how about this? And he'd put some like fucking bass thing, like that's fucking genius, and and um, that's what I mean. Todd makes fun of himself for not knowing how to play and all that kind of shit, and it's just it's just not true, really. Like he. Uh, he was such he, oh sorry guys he was such a um, valuable component and and Greg coming into the thing just really cemented it all my wife Susan like I've been with her for 24 years you know and so when this kind of came she's like wait which band was this like what's <laughs> what what's going on I said well uh, okay we made a recording a long time I, Fuck, you were tw- twelve. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, I was seventeen. Uh, so you know, now that it's become more, weird, she keeps asking me more questions. So where did you guys play? What, like, what? How'd you guys do it? She doesn't. She didn't come up in punk rock. So to try to explain all of that to mm-hmm, her mm-hmm. Um, it is a little tough. But um, 
it's really fun to have this thing. Like you said, the time capsule come out. It was really fun for me when Greg sent me the SoundCloud of it and I put it on in my car. I'm like, holy fuck, this thing sounds amazing. And, and uh, the songs were, yeah, it's totally a time capsule. And uh, <laughs> it's really... Yeah. It's really fun that, that we're, we're doing this 39 years later. If you enjoyed this episode of the Living 1982 podcast, circle back for weekly episodes and find out about each week's special guests and where to stream the music by following the band's release on Instagram at the Living 1982.